Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers amis. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, yearly, I understand, colloquium. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, at Brown University, and uh, I, I thank the organizers for, for uh, this event. Sexual violence in war and armed conflict is, uh, I'm often told, unavoidable. Some say that it should be uh, considered collateral damage, or I've heard the expression, boys will be boys, uh, that the phenomenon is nothing new, and the latter is uh, certainly true. Uh, actually, already Homer in the uh, Iliad uh, described how Trojan women were treated as war prizes, the most famous of whom was uh, Briseis, you know, the princess of Lunessus, who was given to Achilles for having led the assault on uh, the city during the Trojan War. Also, the Bible contains references to virgins as prizes of war. Moses uh, um, said, have you let all the women la live? Kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known man by lying with him. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. In more recent history, we have numerous examples of rape and sexual violence from the 30 years war, from the US Civil War, colonial wars in Africa, the Central European counter-revolution in the 20s, the Second World War, both in Asia, Russia, and uh, Europe, including the post-conflict situations in the countries affected. And from our days, we uh, know of horrible accounts of rape uh, uh, on an unprecedented scale in the Western Balkans, R Rwanda, Timor-Leste, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. All of this can certainly make rape and sexual violence seem unavoidable as uh, if it were something we would have to accept as part of or consequence of any conflict. But we cannot and should not accept these uh, false premises and empty assertions. Sexual violence in conflict is uh, neither cultural nor sexual. It's criminal. And no other human rights violation is routinely dismissed uh, as inevitable. Actually, we are running a slideshow, I understand, which shows just some photos from uh, my last uh, visit to, to the DRC. The nature of, and I will start with this, to dis describe the changing nature of uh, armed conflict, because the, the nature of, of wars has uh, changed dramatically in recent times. Um, war could traditionally be described as being a fight over territory uh, between two countries through the instruments of well-trained, disciplined uh, armies uh, uh, at, on, on the battlefield. But modern warfare is predominantly intrastate or domestic, waged by non-state actors and triggered by issues of identity, ethnicity, religion, and competition for land or resources, particularly oil and mineral wealth. And in the DRC, for example, control of the country's minerals has fueled the country's conflict by enriching armed groups uh, who have employed sexual violence as a tactic of war. And one such mineral, Colton, is so widely used in mobile phones that, as somebody said, we all carry a piece of, of the Congo in our pockets. The changing, this changing nature of armed conflict has also led to a transformation in terms of who is mostly affected by the hostilities. Uh, during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, for example, civilian casualties were almost non-existent, while today more than 70% of those killed or wounded in wars are non-combatants. In contemporary, low-intensity wars, rebel groups and government forces often kill civilians and defy international law. And it has been said that most civilians tend to die from war 
rather than in battle. And women have ended up on the front line, not as soldiers, but as victims. For each rape reported, it is likely that 10 to 20 go unreported. Sexual violence in conflict has become the weapon of choice. And the reason is as simple as it is wicked, because it's cheap, silent, and effective. One does not need bullets or bombs, only individuals with cruel intent. And acts of sexual violence do not only maim its victims mentally and physically, but they sow the seeds of destruction of an entire community. Female survivors in some instances become pregnant, often get infected with HIV AIDS, can develop incontinence, um, and are regularly rejected by their own families. Traditionally, the risks for the architects behind the atrocities have been negligible. While the women walk in shame, the perpetrators walk free. The challenge is to overcome on an individual level the physical and psychological trauma of rape and other forms of sexual violence in conflict should not be underestimated. In addition to the long-term psychological injur injuries that may include depression, anxiety di disorders, flashbacks, difficulties in re-establishing intimate relationships, and fear. Sexual violence is also an obstacle to sustainable peace for several reasons. Long-term sexual violence undermi undermines social safety through the destruction of families and communities. The fear of assaults is an impediment to women's participation in economic activities and girls' school attendance. And if impunity reigns, the faith in a country's judicial system and its ability to protect its citizens is seriously undermined. Women must be active participants during the peace process and its aftermath and must take an equal role in shaping these decisions. And lack of a reconciliation process which includes women might jeopardize the long-term stability of a society after a conflict is over. No peace agreement engineered solely by men will ever be legitimate as long as wars affect the lives and livelihoods of women. No society emerging from the ashes of conflict can realize its full potential unless women and girls are free to realize theirs. And unfortunately, this far from often happens. For many in positions of power, women are only seen as victims rather as agents of change. And despite women's active engagement in informal efforts to build peace, they are often excluded from any formal peace building efforts. And I know that um, some UN um, agencies actually counted uh, and looked at the peace agreements that have been signed uh, in, in modern days. Uh, I think they looked over um, 30 years, and f in more than 345 peace agreements, uh, sexual violence was mentioned in 18. And I think there is less than 3% women who, who are signatories of, of uh, peace agreements. As an item on the global policy-making agenda, sexual violence in conflict has traditionally been silent. It, it, it has, or absent, and it has been called history's greatest silence. Uh, and also the least condemned uh, war crime, despite its horrible and very real existence on the ground. And the UN Security Council, which of course bears the primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security, established uh, Resolution 1325, as you know, 10 years ago, and this was the first resolution to recognize that war impacts women and men differently and mandated that the United Nations itself and its member states protect individuals from sexual violence in conflict. It would take another decade until the specific issue of sexual violence uh, in conflict became the subject of its own uh, resolution, namely 1820, which recognized sexual violence as a tactic of war and it confirms that sexual violence in conflict is a matter of international peace and security and therefore within the remit of the Security Council. 
a resolution, that resolution demands nothing less than the immediate and complete cessation by all parties to armed conflict of all acts of sexual violence against civilians, and was a historic response to uh, this horrific reality. And finally, Resolution 1888 from last year established the position that I'm the first to hold to act as an advocate, coordinator, and leader within the UN system to address this issue. And it also requested that the UN Action Against Sexual Violence, a network of 13 UN entities, assist me in this task. Legally speaking, the notion that sexual violence in conflict is a crime against international law has emerged only very recently, I would say after, uh, mainly after the war in the Balkans, and has been established first and foremost through jurisprudence emanating from uh, different uh, international criminal tribunals, the one for Rwanda, the ICTR, and the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY. Uh, a strictly legal definition of rape and other forms of sexual violence continues to develop. And under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, ICC, rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and any other forms of sexual uh, violence of comparable gravity, as it says, are recognized both as crimes against humanity and as war crimes. Earlier this year, I visited for a second time uh, the DRC, and the eastern part of the DRC has been called the rape capital of the world. I did not coin the phrase. I think uh, some journalists did. Um, but uh, for a reason, over 200,000 rapes have been reported since the war began in the country more than a decade ago. And only a few months ago, another 300 plus rapes were reported to have taken place in the Valikale territory in North Kivu. And a 70-year-old woman that we met uh, told me that uh, she had tried uh, in, in vain to uh, convince the rapists to leave her alone, uh, pointing out that uh, they could uh, be her own grandchildren. We, uh, as the United Nations, are often criticized for our shortcomings and mistakes, and the Valikali incidents were no different. And this has also been acknowledged. Uh, the uh, Security Council has discussed this issue repeatedly, and rather than trying to present excuses, we need to look at explanations and what we can improve. I also think it is important to start looking at what we already do well and how these actions can be further strengthened. And in response to this changing dynamics of conflict that I outlined earlier, and in light of lessons learned, we have to be better at protecting civilians, especially uh, the, the women. And the UN's peacekeeping troops have um, gathered best practices how to do this in an inventory an analytical inventory of peacekeeping practice developed by this UN Action Network and that I helped to launch earlier this year. And what is in that inventory? What are the, the, the best peacekeeping practices? They mention community liaison officers, which can help to, to build and develop trust uh, with the community, including with, with women. And of course, ideally, we need both women and men to serve in these positions, to use more foot patrols, to actively engage with, uh, with the population, uh, and of course ensure through better training that peacekeepers know how to recognize and react to reports of sexual violence and, and better interpret and, and understand how to react to early warning signals. In the case of, uh, of Valikale, there were 15 villages affected. Uh, these two, mainly these two rebel groups, the Mai Mai Cheka and the uh, FDLR, closed off uh, the road. They started to loot and, and pillage in these villages. Then you can assume rape. You, you must assume rape. And, and this is where, um, where I think the UN uh, system failed. They have to signal night presence uh, in areas uh, at risk of, of attack. And they can use joint patrols, uh, which include 
peacekeepers, but acknowledge that the main responsibility, of course, rests with uh, local and, and regional and national authorities. States bear primary responsibility for protecting their citizens from violence, and I see my role to, um, as helping to build the capacity of governments to meet their obligations, because the United Nations and no number of peacekeepers can substitute or supplant uh, a state. And capacity building means improving data collection, statistics, monitoring, evaluation, and, and be better reporting mechanisms. And those data must be, of course, widely publicized uh, in order to educate uh, communities. Having the right um, monitoring and reporting in turn makes it safer and easier for women to report these crimes. Um, and there, this, uh, the whole issue, of course, is no small challenge to most of, of these countries. Rape and other forms of sexual violence, as you've understood, is not a specifically African problem. Um, I visited Sarajevo last week uh, to learn how um, sexual violence used in the, the wars in the, in the Balkans actually uh, has also there brutalized the whole society. And the way of war has become a way of life. And that's uh, a big risk that, that we, we run. And the visit highlighted the, how bad the situation still is for women there, 15 years after the Dayton Peace Accord. And so far in the domestic legal system, 12 perpetrators have been put to justice, and the estimate is that there might have been between um, 50 and 60,000 rapes. One survivor who had been held in a camp with her 20-year-old daughter during the war told me that she often, uh, these days, bumped into the perpetrator um, in the bank, and he tried to smile at them. Um, and where uh, war veterans actually receive a pension, women survivors are still waiting for the reparations that they are entitled to. I've outlined to the Security Council that I want to focus my work on five to seven countries during my, my mandate, in, in addition to Liberia, the DRC, and Bosnia, which I've visited. My team and I are currently also considering including Colombia, Timor-Leste, uh, uh, among, uh, among the countries. And I think it is important also to look at where is this not used, uh, or where is, is it used in, a, in an irregular uh, uh, manner? Are there areas where, this is, that we, where we cannot prove that it has been used as a war or a tactic of, of war? And um, Sri Lanka has been mentioned, and then still remember with the, the caveat that in all these countries, uh, rapes, uh, there are rapes, there is discrimination against women, a lot of violence, but uh, there are areas and conflicts where we cannot see that it has been used as a, a tactic or a weapon of, of war. In the Middle East, it is also not, uh, as far as we know uh, today, uh, used in, in that uh, fashion. Why is this, and what can we learn from these and other regions in order to spread the knowledge to um, those parts of the world where this is still a huge issue? What can we learn about peer pressure? Uh, for example. So there are gaps in our, in our uh, knowledge, uh, theoretical knowledge about, about it as well. I also believe that we have to impose tougher terms when providing assistance to countries. I think donors and different parts of the U.S. system must be better coordinated. And uh, today, very often, they work too uh, compartmentalized and, uh, or in silos, and I think we just have to make sure that we uh, become uh, much more effective. Um, I think there are some uh, positive signs as well and some good achievements over the last uh, years. I mean, the Beijing Platform for Action, and we have 189 countries as signatories to, to that in 1995 agreed to strengthen the participation of women in national reconciliation and reconstruction and to investigate and punish those who perpetuate violence against women in armed conflict. So we have the, we have the normative framework, we have the uh, ambitious uh, 
legislation and the ambitious uh, targets established. One of the few glimpses of light and hope during the, this last visit to the DRC was the apprehension of Lieutenant Colonel Mayele, one of the rebel commanders from the Mai Mai Cheka uh, group. And this was followed only a few days later by uh, the ICC announcing that they had arrested, um, or the French uh, uh, authorities had arrested Kalisma Burashimana and allegedly he's the executive secretary of the, of the FDLR. Um, and less than two weeks ago, I was also in The Hague to attend the opening of the trial against Jean-Pierre Bemba. And this is an important case for several principal reasons because, uh, again, um, sexual violence is defined as a war crime, a crime against humanity. Uh, it is command responsibility that, that is uh, at stake here. And this is uh, where uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba is accused of, not, of uh, um, not having prevented sexual violence by his, uh, by his army. Uh, and also because the number of rapes outnumber uh, the, the killings and other forms of, of atrocities. And this was also the case in, in Valikale. No killings, but uh, several hundred rapes. Um, this is how I want to use the mandate given to me by the Secretary General and the Security Council, and I'll finish with that in five short points. The first point is ending impunity, uh, ensuring that perpetrators do not remain at the helm of security institutions and that amnesty is never an option for these type of, of crimes. And if, if women continue to suffer from sexual violence, it's not because the law is inadequate to protect them, but because it is inadequately enforced. The second point, women must be empowered, be given a voice, a seat, uh, and influence. And a ceasefire is not synonymous with peace for women if the shooting stops, but rapes continue unchecked. The third point is to mobilize political uh, leadership, because these resolutions that we have uh, are tools in the hands of political leaders and should be used as such. Um, and uh, also, uh, if I may mention that I think that the US has led the way when it comes to addressing the whole issue of, of um, um, conflict minerals. And I think that other countries in the world should follow, because the most effective would, of course, be to have a, a global regime. Fourth is the increased recognition of rape as a tactic and a consequence of, of conflict, to close the knowledge gaps that we have, um, and also that the, the Security Council um, should not underestimate the tools that it has at its disposal, and they should be ready to, to use them. And finally, my role is also to drive a better coordination of the entire UN system to make sure that we coordinate and harmonize what we are doing in a more effective way. So women have no rights if those who violate their rights go unpunished. And I'm still haunted by what I heard in the DRC but also in Sarajevo. Uh, women are still not safe under their own roofs in their own beds when night falls. And our aim must be to uphold international law so that women, even in war-torn um, corners of our world, can sleep uh, safe and sound. And far from being a niche issue, sexual violence is part of a larger pattern. Rule by sexual violence is used by political and military leaders to achieve political, military, and economic ends. And these crimes present a security crisis that demands a security response. And to me, that analytical inventory of best peacekeeping practices is the start, not, not the end, of a process to identify what works in preventing sexual violence and improving women's security. And much more must yet be done to promote actions that have real impact as we move from recognition to action, and from best intentions to best practice. And that journey, I think, has only begun. Thank you for listening to me.